Good evening, welcome to Left, Right and Center. I'm Vishnu Shom. It's a one hour special today. And we have a lot of special reports for you and big debates. Uh, well, Delhi and a handful of states in the Northeast, in fact, eight states in total, have opened up today. They've opened up schools for children. This at a time when there has been a report of a spike in positivity cases among children in six states where schools had opened earlier. So on the show, in our first debate, should reopening of schools have been delayed till students were vaccinated? Remember, one of the vaccines has in fact been cleared. It's just not been rolled out as yet for kids. So why the rush? Next up, the price of liquefied petroleum gas cylinders across all categories, including subsidized gas, has been hiked by 25 rupees a cylinder. This is in fact the third straight hike in prices in less than two months. The Congress and opposition parties have hit out of the government. The Congress says this is Modiji's promise of Ache Din. And finally, at 9.30 p.m., a special report on a landmark effort at dealing with the emotional well-being of CRPF Jawans. I'm just back from Srinagar where I had a look at a program called Love You Zindagi for Jawans, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder and operating in a male-dominated system where the burden of patriarchy often means that relationships with spouses and kids are fraught with tension, all add up to their work and it's problematic. But this is something the CRPF is now looking to fix. I have a report and an interview with the key officer behind all of this. But first, let's uh, quickly move on to our top story, schools reopening countrywide. From Delhi to Meghalaya, Telangana to Tamil Nadu, schools reopened in several states for classes 9 to 12 with several protocols like 50% students in a class. In Delhi, all government schools and a few private schools reopened today after 17 months with COVID protocols like staggered lunch breaks and only vaccinated staff. I think it's very good because there are doubts in online, there are doubts in network issues. I've been talking a lot about my friends and we've read books together. There was a little distance in our friends. My son and I were both very excited that after two or two years, after two or two years, the school is open. But they have also a social connectivity of their friends, 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 social connectivity of their friends. अब कुछ सफर नहीं होगा। घर में मम्मी है और पापा पापा एक्सपायर हो गए थे कोविड के चलते हैं। ऐसे में हम डेटा की तो रहती थी प्रॉब्लम हर महीने डलवाना पड़ता था 200-200 रुपए नहीं हो पाता था इतना इतना नहीं कमा पाते हम। Others while happy that the schools had opened were concerned about the timing. Every time there is some festival or some congregation, the covid cases rise. I'm not naming things, but it led to spread of wave two. अगर अभी भी स्कूल नहीं खोले कॉलेज नहीं खोले तो एक पूरी की पूरी जेनरेशन नॉलेज गैप के साथ आगे बढ़ेगी। Schools across Tamil Nadu opened today for classes 11 and 12. The state's daily cases has dipped to around 1500 now. In Chennai, the reopening also unfolded tragic stories. 300 students at Everwind School alone lost a parent to COVID. Also disturbing stories of job losses and salary cuts. My mom is a teacher. She is uh, taking online class for the students. So she was getting only half a salary. That, that means 50 percentage. For that uh, COVID and all, I was to go to many activities class. And I can't uh, go to this class because of financial was low. Schools in Rajasthan reopened after nearly five months having shut in mid-April. Only classes 9 to 12 have been allowed to physically attend school. For the rest, online classes will continue. Nearly 13 lakh children in Rajasthan have missed schooling in the one and a half years of the pandemic. These are children with no access to mobile phones or are in very remote areas with poor connectivity. मैम हो सकती थी लेकिन क्या कभी का नेटवर्क प्रॉब्लम कभी ये प्रॉब्लम होता था इसलिए मैम स्कूल चाहिए कम से कम बल से स्कूल तो अच्छा लगता है जो भी हमारे गवर्नमेंट के एसओपी की गाइडलाइन है उनकी उनकी पूर्णता से पालना कर रहे हैं आप खुद देख रहे हैं मैंने अपने स्टाफ को जगह जगह पे मॉनिटरिंग्स के लिए लगा रखा है प्राइमरी स्कूल अक्रॉस उत्तर प्रदेश हैव ओपन अप आफ्टर अ लॉन्ग गैप ड्यू टू द कोविड पैंडमिक 
uh, I think it's really exciting to see students inside actual physical classrooms, especially in UP's rural areas, because online learning and learning through television is really something that is a little difficult for those who come from poor backgrounds, and that is why these visuals are very heartening. The UP government, which had opened middle and senior schools 15 days ago, has said that primary schools for classes 1 to 5 will run in two shifts with full COVID protocols like masks, sanitizers and social distancing. Classroom ki tulna kabhi bhi online section nahi kar sakta. Jab bachya aur hum usko aapas mein samaj paate hai. In Meghalaya, schools and colleges have reopened for classes 9 to 12 in urban areas and 6 to 12 in rural areas. We love offline classes because we can meet friends uh, in school, we can talk, we can play, we can learn more. We would like to thank the government because of the last two years due to this pandemic the school was closed. It was affecting our students mentally also and physically also. As schools reopen in most states across the country, teachers are happy with the center's announcement that it will provide two crore additional vaccine doses in the last week of August to immunize school teachers. Some parents who are still not sending their kids to school are waiting for the government to fulfill its promise of starting vaccinations for those above 12 from the first week of October. An NDTV Bureau report. Well, joining us now, Raghav Chadda, MLA and spokesperson of the Ahmadmi Party, Lakhmen Yumbui, the Minister in Charge of Education in the Government of Meghalaya. Anubha Sahai is the President of an India Wide's Parents Association, Sudha Acharya, Principal of ITL Public School. We've got uh, Pooja Kaprihan, she's a parent who sent her child to a school in Noida today. So it's a big panel, but I think we've got as many voices as we can, important ones. Raghav, um, how would you respond to those who say that you should have waited a little while, at least till such time as all teachers got vaccinated, two doses? Uh, look, Vishnu, I think the question has now changed from uh, whether schools should be open now to what are the conditions under which schools can be safely open. Right. We live in a post-pandemic world. We live in an era where, you know, the threat of a third wave is still looming large and we are very much cognizant of it. But at the same time, when we talk about the livelihood costs and using that argument opens shopping malls, gyms, schools, uh, 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 you know, uh, movie theaters, etc. We must also consider the costs that are, uh, you know, uh, uh, that are that are linked to schools being shut, which include primarily learning cost. Second is the loss of learning competencies. And thirdly, the psychological mental costs that you know this the that that is also born because of one and a half almost two years of an ac academic year washout i think at a time when schools uh, when gyms etc are being reopened it is important that we create an environment a safe one of course where schools should also be open now when i when i say this as somebody who's a legislator in the government a part of the delhi government we are also looking very closely at you know uh, this the spikes in the cases the transmission rates the infection rate etc and very closely monitoring that as well right. and you know if we do see that there is a spike in that we will certainly reverse our decisions but i think it's high, high time that the loss of learning that our uh, children have undergone over the last one and a half years you know, school also is important. needs to be the looked question into. is you know i mean can you ensure 100 percent foolproof proof safety that it may be it's difficult well there is a readiness plan okay that Raghav, just hang on a motion. second i just want to go across to my other panelists i'll come back to you in a bit anubha sahai joins us as well anubha does that response by Raghav satisfy you that you know you try and be as safe as possible <laughs> but look at the losses we've incurred as a country for our children, we just have to have them back in a smart way. Yeah, no doubt. We, are, we also want that the children should be back to school, but not in this way. Right now, they don't have any data, either Delhi government or Maharashtra or any other government. And we are asking whether how many teachers are vaccinated, how many staff are vaccinated. And as children will be commuting in public transport, how many drivers and moshis are vaccinated, they don't have proper data with them. We also want that our children should go back to school with proper protocol be in place, but that doesn't seem to be in place what we can see. 
and uh, maximum chil uh, children are also not vaccinated we know the vaccines are not available in india as of now for uh, uh, the children who belong to all these categories 12 and above in other countries like usa now they have started vaccination drive for children but in india it is not happening and if the we don't have proper medical infrastructure in place if anything happens whether any government is willing to take any responsibility no they are not ready to and willing to take any responsibility neither schools are take, taking any responsibility even though with parents consent children are being allowed to uh, attend their classes in yeah. offline mode but i think this is not the safe uh, uh, safe mode of uh, reopening the school once the vaccination drive is complete of teachers and other staff then definitely they can start in a staggered manner but not before that in maharashtra recently in mumbai especially uh, last week i can we can see that how some children were uh, infected with covid when one child came in contact with a staff in a boarding school so now who is taking responsibility nobody is taking responsibility so, just quite besides when the responsibility part of it it's it's very sad if a child gets covid but let me just uh, quickly go across to lakmin yumo the minister from meghalaya thanks so very much for being with us now sir there are some pretty frightening statistics which have come in these are attributed to the indian council for medical research there's been a rise in positivity in children in a, a number of states post their schools opening earlier on punjab opened on the 2nd of august in the month of july school going to the children in the in the school going age group had a 6.5% positivity rate august it went up to 16.1 a growth of 9.6 bihar in july was 6.2 august 11.5 growth of 5.3% mp 6.2 to 9.1% a growth of 2.9% there are a few states where it's also gone down but the numbers uh, are very very minor just 0.1 point 0.2 point in the states where it's gone down so my question to you sir is is this not something that you should have perhaps kept in mind before reopening schools mr rumboy everything was kept on mind before opening the school we are living in a uncertain world where we don't know what is the future of our children we know that children without education it is uh, like uh, become a useless citizen so we have to as a responsible citizen it is not only the duty of the government it is a duty of each one of us as a citizen how to provide the safe environment and education to our children we know in this last few months the loss of children is very high if, if uh, because for the holistic development of the children we need the children have to have a knowledge progression the children have to have uh, emotional intelligence that children have to have a psychological growth the all these things will happen only if that the classroom teaching is open so we uh, we know the constraint but we don't know what is the way forward okay. but at some point of time we have we have to start somewhere i only request that each and every stakeholder be the parent be the society we have to guide our children we have to guide ourselves to be a responsible citizen to take so that the school could open in a free environment i'm very happy that in the state of meghalaya that more than 75% of the teachers have been vaccinated that's fantastic and, uh, that's this absolutely is absolutely uh, fantastic so have they been uh, double vaccinated or single vaccinated uh, some are single vaccinated and some are double vaccinated and by when sir uh, by, by when mr rumboy would uh, almost 100% of teachers in your school be in your state i beg your pardon be double vaccinated because that is a wonderful ideal by when would that take place that it depend upon the timeline which they have vaccinated. do you believe but it would take place within the next two months i am sure but the but the vaccination is not compulsory uh, because we cannot force the teacher to vaccinate themselves for those who have not vaccinated every 10 days they have to produce the negative rt pcr test so that the classroom that's teaching will be safe that's very interesting that's very interesting indeed Pooja Kaprihan um you know I I just read out a couple of statistics of where the positivity rate has gone up then there are some states where it's also gone down among children now you're you're a parent yourself you've sent your class 5 child to school today what were some of the thoughts going on in your mind well uh, frankly there's a very thin line right now for a parent uh, between looking at the physical well-being of a child 
and striking a balance with the mental well-being as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very difficult decision to take. Uh, but for us, for me as a parent, I think the most important thing was the preparedness of the school. Uh, uh, most of our teachers and support staff were vaccinated, double vaccinated. And uh, we, when we were not to be using the transport, we would have dropped the child ourselves. And uh, in our school, uh, there's a hybrid uh, model which is being followed where, I, where the children from grade five, I mean, the junior school are only going to school twice in a week. So I think as a parent, uh, I was very satisfied with the way the school was prepared. Uh, now, as a parent, the question lies, is the medical infrastructure, is the government prepared? Because if there is a prediction of a third wave, ultimately, the onus now does not lie only on us to wear masks and maintain social distance and follow protocols. The onus also lies with the government to show that they are prepared to handle a third wave if it hits us. Yep. Also, I think um, uh, uh, for, for me as a parent, uh, it is very important that my child is able to live in this new normal world, uh, keeping her caged in the house, whereas all of us are out and about like uh, normal, wearing a mask and maintaining the standards. It's important for the children to also learn these new normals and they cannot learn it if they're locked up in the houses. It can only happen if they go out of the houses into school. Sure. So, uh, uh, so I take your point. I just want to go across to Sudha Acharya. You know, ma'am, um, you're a principal yourself and you will know that children aren't comfortable. They don't exactly like having a piece of cloth on their face. Nobody does, particularly children. We played a story out before we began this interview and I was seeing our visuals from a small village school in Uttar Pradesh where a large number of children didn't have their masks on. Is it not difficult for teachers to ensure that masks are kept on? Children don't want them on. And that represents a big concern, doesn't it? Yeah, I completely agree with you. Uh, but I must tell a motivating story of my school. I started my school on August 12 for class 10 and 12 and uh, whole classes were coming and very encouraging uh, attendance earlier also on NDTV I said that I'm getting 92 93 percent attendance it's only because all of us stakeholders we are working together if children sit at home we are leading towards a generational catastrophe you know there is huge learning gap and we are not able to achieve their learning outcome as per their developmental goal, neither we are able to uh, uh, talk about their psychosocial well-being, take care of their psychosocial well-being. I must tell you, during this lockdown two years, individually parents have come with children for counseling, hmm. for depression, for anxiety, for panic attack. So we could not say no, school door is closed. So we have given individual attention. So in our school, we have taken all protocols. And today I must tell you that class 12, we celebrated our investiture ceremony. So the school council body, they were so motivated. They said that, ma'am, we will take care as peer leaders. We will create awareness, sensitize our youngsters. We'll take care that, that on the school corridor, entry, exit, even washing room or canteen, playground, everywhere we will maintain protocol. But I can see their happiness and I must thank my parents, my school parents who have got enough trust and understanding on us to send their children. Even class so nine started. Let me ask you, what if a yeah. teacher falls unwell or if a student falls unwell, yeah, how have... important is it for you to send a message out to the teachers or to parents that if your child is unwell, any suspicion, don't send them. How yes, important we, is that? We have uh, created a papama and all my teachers, not only teaching staff, my conservancy staff, all bus drivers, conductors, my admin staff, non-teaching staff, all are double vaccinated. We organized vaccination for them in that, my that school great. itself. That, that, that is very All of them. All, all of right, ma'am, just one second. Raghav has been waiting to come in for a while. Go ahead, Raghav. Uh, Vishnu, Vishnu, as far as the Delhi government is concerned, we have only open schools for the 9th, 10th, yeah. 11th and 12th standard, not the entire right. nursery to 12th school, number one. Number two, the uh, only 50% of the total strength of the classroom can be asked to come to school at one go. And that too, the seating arrangement is such that one child will sit on one desk. Uh, apart from that, the, the the timing of the the timetable of the classrooms are designed in a staggered manner, so that whether it's their lunch break, 
or the sports period, etc. It should be, you know, there should be a proper staggered way of 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 executing that. Now, as far as you know, the spread of the infection is concerned, the positivity rate in Delhi is perhaps at an all-time low. We are at 0.04 percent positivity rate, and we have managed to vaccinate a huge chunk of our population and. Uh, of course, teachers, school, uh, b- bus drivers, etc., also stand vaccinated. So, therefore, I think this is the right time to open schools. And you know, we are very often, Vishnu, on this channel also, we've discussed the economic cost of lockdown and the lack of it. But we fail to discuss the loss of learning, loss of learning outcomes, yep. as well as the mental cost and yep. agony that you know children go through. Uh, forget yep. parents and teachers. And merely because that is not economically quantifiable or not immediately economically quantifiable, we tend to, you know, not even take this into consideration. I think it's time that every government looks at, you know, uh, uh, you know, the 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 learning of our children. Otherwise, this washout of two academic years, a minimum of two academic years can have a catastrophic impact on the. No, no, I I, I, I understand all of what you're trying to say. Raghav, my humble, my only submission over here is that while in a state like Delhi, we are going through a fantastic time right now with the COVID numbers, assuming that they are all correct and things like that. Nobody knows the impact of long COVID. Nobody, neither you nor me, nor any doctor. And there is a bit of a risk right now. Uh, I just want to go back to Anubha. uh, And you know, that is the question. There is something called long COVID. We are aware of it. We've seen this in patients. We don't really have enough science on how it impacts children in the long run. Um, so is this not perhaps the biggest worry that, yes, children, uh, you know, I mean, don't, don't get it as bad. Fatality rates among children much, much lower. But no one really knows the long-term outcome of this, right? Is that something that bothers you, Anubha? Uh, yeah, definitely. See, Vishnu, as far as... Uh the children, uh, children's learning is concerned, no doubt. Many children are out of school because of digital divide we can see across India. In metro cities also, we have seen that many children, many students complain to me that we, are, we don't have internet access, we don't have mobile gadgets, we are not able to study. So they wanted to go, to, go back to school. Even we want that the ch- school should reopen. But right now, this is not the right time in India because we don't have vaccines available for children as of now. Once the children are vaccinated, definitely many parents will be sending their children to school. But all right, I just right, as of now, are having private those who are having uh, access to private transport, those who are having their own vehicle, they can drop their children to school. But, but maximum what about parents, the others? They don't have Ma'am, I'm running public. short on time. I just want yes. to get a quick one-line answer from Mr. Rubhoy and uh, also from Raghav. Ha- are you appealing to? the government to release Zydus Cadilla in your state so that children can be vaccinated faster. Raghav, to you first. It's an approved drug. Are you well, pushing Vishnu, the I'm, government so that kids I can be vaccinated is, in Delhi? Vishnu, this is a question best answered by the health minister. I unfortunately okay. do not have any right. personal knowledge of this. Not a problem. Mr. Yumbui, would you have an answer to that question? Are you going to push the centre to get Zydus Cadilla into your state? It is now an approved vaccine for children? That is a very, very important question, but because we need to take a role about the safety of our children, if there is a way forward, I think the government of India, if the uh, vaccine has been approved, it has been approved, is why I'm asking. Student, so that the classroom teaching, safe environment in the classroom could be start at the earliest. Okay, I'm running well, out of if, time. If it's I'd been like approved, to... there is no reason why. Why, why any state government should not buy it and, and you know, inoculate its citizens, Vishnu? We have been, we have been from day one, a big votary of vaccinating children as well as, you know, Super. all other adults. So let's adults. hope that that happens. Uh, children in school, it's wonderful in terms of, uh, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's essential for us in our country. But of course, health concerns remain. A cool question which has emerged, Srishri Srivastav uh, asks, as schools are gradually reopening amidst a fear of the third wave of COVID, Although there is a lack of vaccines, vaccination of teachers is being prioritized. What about students? That's what we've been discussing. So in a poll, we asked, should schools have delayed reopening till kids were vaccinated against COVID? Yes, 67. No, 33. So that's a bit surprising. Uh, Word of mouth seemed to suggest that many more wanted schools to be open right now. We're going to take a short break. Uh, Up after that, we're going to be looking at the rise in LPG prices, a political debate, a huge one. 
in the country. Well, the other big story, we're tracking the prices of LPG across all categories, including subsidized gas, has been hiked by 25 rupees a cylinder, the third straight increase in rates in less than two months. We've got the prices in, in, in uh, the major cities. But let me quickly go across to my panel. I'm joined by Supriya Shinit uh, of the Congress Party and uh, Rajat Sethi. Uh, Rajat, now the Congress has tweeted saying March 2014, gas cost 410 rupees a cylinder. September 2021, 884 rupees a cylinder in seven years. The cost has more than doubled. This is Modi ji's promise of Ache Din. How would you respond to that? Well, I don't want to respond to any political commentary, uh, but just going by uh, the sheer logic, uh, you are not supposed to put out just the price of the cylinder. You also need to put in the subsidy bills. So alongside quoting the price, you can quote a price of zero as well, as long as somebody from India, the Indians have to pay for the bill of uh, the subsidy. Um, ultimately, uh, we all understand that uh, the government's revenues are fixed and it needs to be redistributed in the best possible manner. Uh, Congress had a formulation. They came out with a NIAI scheme, which the public early rejected. BJP has a, another set of formulation, and they are trying to uh, do the redistribution that way. It could be flawed as well. That is for the public to decide. But purely economically speaking, LPG's gas prices are actually determined by import price parities. The IPP formulation was something that was created by the Congress party itself. Okay. So there cannot be two doubts about why did it suddenly increase. The answers is how the Congress devised the policy when it comes to LPG All right, gas Supriya, pricing. The point being made is that the Congress devised the policies. This was something that was bound to happen. It's absolutely a silly argument to make and I will tell you why because I've covered oil and gas very, very closely. India's LPG prices are decided by the Saudi Aramco LPG prices. And if you go by the Saudi Aramco LPG prices and the exchange rate, India's LPG cylinder should cost you 630 rupees. But in many parts of the country, it's going to cost you as much as a thousand rupees because of transportation costs and all of that. Yes, we give subsidies. Why is this government not giving LPG subsidies? Because right. the market price and the controlled price of the LPG cylinder is today the same. So there is no scope for subsidy. Mr. Modi can keep chest, you know, thumping his chest about the Ujwala scheme. And right now in Maharaj Ganj, Eastern Uttar Pradesh, not one person is refilling their cylinders. I've met women after women who've said, our budgets have gone for a toss. Prices of daily living have skyrocketed and we cannot afford. And what is the government expected to do? LPG prices have gone up by 290 rupees in the last eight and a half months. 290 rupees is a 50% jump over prices that they were in November 2020. There's got to be some respite for people who are reeling under wage losses, who are reeling under job losses. What are we expected to tell those people? Okay. That this government is going to look the other way? In fact, uh, Rajat, she has a point when she says, if you look at the Ojula Yojana, uh, the second leg was just launched last month by the Prime Minister. That is meant to ease people's access to LPG. But if prices have gone up so much, doesn't it defeat the purpose of the scheme? Well, there are a couple of things that you need to keep in mind. What uh, uh, Supriya ji was suggesting was that there is no subsidy. That is factually incorrect and I want to correct her. 12 cylinders are actually given on subsidized prices. In fact, your introductory uh, comment itself, Krishnoji, was that the subsidized prices are there. There is something called a subsidized pricing. 12 cylinders are provided on subsidized pricing to the poor. And therefore, uh, poor being able to afford or not afford has less to do with the LPG prices per se, but the overall purchasing power. And I think these two points are pretty different. We need to, uh, uh, no, we need to ensure that there is an all-round growth there is an all-round growth in the per capita income as well, which should result in, in buying uh, the purchasing power capacities no, but of if purchasing the poor power is low and buy. prices go up, then it becomes no, problematic, no, Rajat? No, it does. It does. It does. No, absolutely. There no, is no denying purchasing that Purchasing power but is what not I... the factor. It is, it's the root of the issue. We are having this conversation because purchasing power is hit. In a situation like that, if the price goes up, then where does the money come from? Well, again, as I said, I... Uh, Sub subsidized half a second subsidized yeah. lpg subsidized lpg cylinders prices can be uh, controlled by the government through active interventions and government will do something about it for the non subsidized lpg cylinder i am not pretty sure because the ipp formulation which was put in place by okay. the congress party uh, still continues and the government doesn't feel that it is duty bound to subsidize the rich on okay, the that, that, on the non subsidized all right uh, cylinders. Uh, supriya respond to that 
How much soever I disagree with Mr. Sethi, I appreciate his optimism about the government will do something. The government hasn't moved an inch to bring any respite to the common man throughout the corona crisis. I wonder when will the government act? That's a really big question. But hats off to your optimism, Mr. Sethi. Uh, you're a supporter. It appears so. However, having said that, I have one more question to ask of this government. At a time like this, what is expected of the central government? You've amassed 23 lakh crore rupees in fuel excise duty. Large chunk of that is the central government's individual share. Why can you not bring in some respite? That's the question everybody is asking. 290 rupee jump. Did you ever imagine LPG could go up like that? And please remember, the 20% GDP hike that this government is celebrating is actually faulted. It's flawed because it's coming on the back of uh, recession, it's coming on the back of huge contraction of 24%. Okay, so Priya, just half and a second. You know, Rajat, I'll, I'll, I'll let you answer what... Private consumption has gone down. Sure, private I'll let you answer what, what Supriya says, but I just want to point out one more thing. Between 2014 and 2021, forget about LPG for a moment, let's look at everything else. Petrol from 60 rupees, uh, it's gone up to 104 a litre. Diesel from 50 to 98. LPG 414 to 887. Dal from 70 to 138. Ghee from 350 to 567, sarso oil from 52 to 220. It's catastrophic, particularly in a COVID situation, Rajat. Please, Vishnuji, let me get back to my original comment. Please understand 60 rupees without you showcasing the number, the amount on the subsidy. How does it complete the picture in the first place? My repeated statement is that you can give it for zero there also. No Somebody has to put the subsidy bill. Some, there is no please. subsidy Somebody that the government is willing to give. This is why you there is devise no subsidy a anymore on fuel. You, and that's what you the problem devised is. a formulation for the oil bonds. You said that I'm going to push the cost to the future governments, knowing very well the Congress is not going to come in power. Then why not your people and buy question. their votes? Literally, it's this is the only logic for oil bonds. Otherwise, why would oil bonds be still lingering in this country after seven Can years of Prime Minister Modi still paying through the nose year after year in we are still servicing no, no, the interest, no, no, no. not okay. even the All right. principal okay. amount. I need to wrap this, this up. This point, 60 Vishnu, rupees is a misnomer. It, 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 it okay. diverts the attention from the real cost that the nation was All right, 15 that seconds. Is to to 15 that seconds. Please go ahead, yes. You know, the oil bond theory has to stop. This lie has to stop. You were amassed 23 lakh crore from fuel taxes. Fuel taxation has been 4.5 lakh crore in the last year alone. Oil bonds have been paid off by only 3% of that money. Who are you lying to and why are you lying to the people? All right, no, was, them some respite that's all that's affected of you. No, you please keep quiet. All right, all right, all right, all right. All right. All Both of you, of you, I need to move on, need to move on to something else. This price hike is going to hit millions of people across the country. Will there be any respite in the future? I want to move on to a special report on a landmark effort at dealing with the emotional well-being of CRPF Jawans. In fact, I'm just back from Srinagar where I had a look at a program called Love You Zindagi. For Jawan's depression, post-traumatic stress disorder and operating in a male-dominated system where the burden of patriarchy often means that relationships with spouses are fraught with tension, all of this adds up. Now there's a huge effort at trying to fix it. Hello and welcome to a very special program. I'm Vishnu Shom. Now, whenever we think of our men and women in uniform, there's this assumption that they'll perform no matter what, whichever part of India they may be deployed in. But for a moment, I think it's important to think about some of the conditions that they work in and recognize the fact that as human beings, they face their own set of concerns. For starters, those in the CRPF, for example, work within a system of patriarchy in the past they bear what they call a burden of patriarchy. This is a masculine system, a system that doesn't perhaps understand or recognize gender sensitivity. And this has an impact at all levels. The equation of Jawans with their families, the equation of Jawans with those who they serve, and the interpersonal skills of Jawans as well. Now in a program called Love You Zindagi, the CRPF is trying to correct or to improve many of these issues. It is a landmark program, perhaps the largest of its kind in the world. And the goal is clear. The emotional well-being of our Jawans in the CRPF is essential 
in order for them to work effectively on the ground. The goal is to get Jawans to communicate. And it's not lip service, not at all. There are few services in India more exposed to hardships. A CRPF Jawan moves from Naxal hit Chhattisgarh to anti terror operations in Srinagar and then seamlessly to counter insurgency missions in the Northeast. Stress is a potential killer. But to manage stress, you need to know why and how it hits Jawans. And there is no simple answer. <laughs> Depression, post-traumatic stress disorder and operating in a male-dominated system where the burden of patriarchy often means that relationships with spouses and children are fraught with tension. These all add up. Here, it's being fixed. Through this course, we want that... Vinita is an assistant commandant in the CRPF and a master trainer, along with Javed Ali and Monica DS. When they aren't wielding an AK-47 to defend against terrorist attacks, they're working overtime to expose as many Jawans as possible to the need to talk, to express, to deal with their mental well-being. These are not lectures, they are conversations, sometimes role plays or chopals, where Jawans are told to talk to their colleagues, let out steam, you are not being judged. Through this course we want that people to understand that everything could be done by a Mahila as well. Even your wife could do everything. Right. And you don't have to take the burden, all the burden on your shoulders. Right. As, as well as we are trying to sh show that we Mahila officer, being a lady officer here, being a Mahila Jawans here, we are doing all the duties done by the male counterparts right. here. The response will be different. Female, they have a reach out approach. And most of the times they, they will talk with the people. They will discuss their problems. Men don't. They feel it incompetency. They feel it that uh, their autonomy is being destroyed if they think that we fail to do some work. So, Chaupal's initiative is that every week, 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 every और पैसे इकट्ठा करना है या मकान बनाना है या समटाइम्स हियर उसको कोई इंजरी हो गई उससे अगर वो कुछ मेंटली परेशान है तो चौपाल ये एक ऐसी चीज रही है जिसमें उन्होंने आपस में उनका कम्युनिकेशन बढ़ा है पहले लोगों ने बहुत झिझक महसूस की कि जो चीज उनको उनके साथ हो रही है वो खुद को इमोशनली वीक नहीं दिखाना चाह रहे थे तो वो एक्सप्रेस नहीं करते थे There's a reason why this is happening. In a Rajya Sabha statement, the government has said 680 personnel belonging to paramilitary forces have died by suicide in the last six years. Domestic problems, illness and financial hardships are major contributory factors. Ultimately, the goal is to have a system where CRPF Jawans are more sensitive where there is a natural acceptance of the equality of the sexes, where there is a recognition that opening up conversations doesn't take away from masculinity, and where the relationship between a Jawan and his family is positive and enabling. Breaking gender stereotypes is often done through very innovative means. For example, role plays. Even the stoutest, hardiest male Jawans are sometimes told to play the role of women. The goal is very clear. Men and women can aspire to the same professional success. A Jawan with greater emotional equanimity is crucial for our security. Vishnu Shom for NDTV. This conversation is essential and it's something which the CRPF is now doing in what is believed to be one of the largest such programs in the world. It's called Love You Zindagi and to tell us a little bit about that, we've got the Inspector General of the CRP in Srinagar, Charu Sinha. Thanks ma'am very much for being with us. Gender, patriarchy and respect, three words which we were discussing before we started. You believe that in the CRPF in Telangana where you were serving a few years back, these were three themes which were not being addressed and they had a profound impact on the men that you worked with. How so? 
So in Telangana, uh, when I was back with the uh, state government, the main issue which we were facing in the police stations was that whenever a woman would come to a police station to complain, it was felt that uh, our approach and our sensitivity towards her was lacking. So a couple of things were done. Um, reception counters were created in every police station with a woman uh, heading those counters to be able to deal with women more sensitively. But there was still something lacking. We were really not up to the mark and women were still not free enough to walk into a police station and talk about marital dispute, talk about violence, etc, etc. So we felt that that was not enough. So we reached out to an organization called People for Parrot, based out of Delhi at that point of time and uh, had started having conversations with them about how we can make our men more sensitive mm. towards women. We realized that for a man to be able to be more sensitive to a woman, uh, he first needs to understand mm. the dynamics of his relationship with his spouse better mm. and take a look at how gender has impacted him and his relationships at home first. Mm. So uh, with the help of SP Mehboob Nagar at that point of time, Rama Rajeshwari, we selected a pool of about 30 constables and sub-inspectors. Yeah. And they were uh, taken uh, through a series of gender workshops, right. gender conversations for about four months or so. Right. You know, before you carry on with that, one of the most interesting points you mentioned to me was that in a career lasting 35 to 40 years, um, these CRPF Jawans are away from home for 25 years. That's right. So the equation between them and the family often doesn't exist. It's often very superficial. Mm -hmm. And that leads to tension, all sorts of tensions, yes. which is what you're basically describing yes. in, in what you have experienced, perhaps. Yes. So uh, just to uh, retrace my steps a bit, uh, what happened in Telangana was with the civil police. Right. And that uh, laid the foundation and gave me an idea of how I would like to work further with this. So when I joined the CRPF and came to Bihar sector and then now to Srinagar sector, yes, the first issue which we encountered was the impact of working for so many years in the force away from the families. And uh, the breakdown in communication within a family, when a constable goes home only four to five years on leave, and that's the only time he gets to spend with his family, uh, there was a, a lot of, uh, let us say, side effects of this kind of a relationship. So 25 years away from the family, in community living, living in barracks, and not having the personal space to oneself definitely has its own issues. Sure. Um, and therefore, communication is at the heart of what you're trying to yes. resolve or address. Yes. Um, and that's not easy because there, there are issues of patriarchy associated with wanting to speak. Um, a lot of the men wouldn't want to speak. They would yes. be in denial, yes. um, you know, about whether it's marital problems or interpersonal equations. Um, how big a challenge is it to get them to open up? So uh, the first issue which a man uh, usually comes across is, and when we want to talk to him about his family is, that uh, he would not open up. Right. And uh, he felt that if he opened up, he was uh, making himself more vulnerable. And uh, in general, men um, in general and men in the forces would not like to appear to be vulnerable. So we started a program called uh, Chopal. Uh, which wanted uh, we wanted to initiate a culture of sharing where the man only talks about what has happened mm. in his um, home front mm. in his personal life in the last one week so we do this once a week the first three months uh, men usually take that much time to open up mm. but once one or two people start sharing then that sets the pace mm. and then everybody chips in so very soon we have at different locations of our companies or battalions we have men then talking to each other that this is what happened today morning and I'm really upset about it so the culture of sharing creates what we call a second home here and which is what we actually need to do what about uh, deliverables what are you looking at for example stress, depression, PTSD, and empowerment of families are four of the key themes. Now, each is a, a, a huge body of work. So what is it that you're trying to achieve and where you can go back and say, this is what we've been able to do and this is what we've not been able to do? Right. So uh, stress, anxiety, depression, and PTSD is something which um, any population anywhere across the world uh, faces. And yes, when we talk hmm. about men in conflict theaters who are in the forces, it does, um, it's a little more exa uh, exaggerated or exacerbated. So we wanted to aim at these four things 
and uh, we decided to introduce a global mental health assessment tool for that so we kind of assessed the level of stress in every unit stress anxiety depression and ptsd in every unit because that will help us to do the impact measurement uh, it will help us to break down all these initiatives into a more tangible form so uh, we did this impact uh, with, with this assessment and after a year of this inf uh, this initiative we do intend to do the assessment again mm. to see whether there has been any kind of reduction or not yeah. that will help us to measure better when you say that this is among the largest schemes in the world um, why do you say so i mean you have a, what 24 25000 uh, jawans we were looking to address yes. over here in srinagar yes. and if it works out in the manner that you'd want to yes. then were more than 3 lakh jawans potentially across the crpf yes so uh, this is a pilot it's a huge pilot and we will be able to wrap it up by next february or march and then do the impact assessment which i had already uh, mentioned and yes if um, it works well then we do hope that it will be taken up and scaled over the entire crpf um when you uh, see did you know people changing on the ground on the basis of the training which they've received thus far Could you give us some examples of how you've seen a change on the ground? Yes. So when um, we started this training with the master trainers, and then we have a pool of frontline trainers, and then of course the participants, we found some very interesting and very subtle changes. Uh, we found people going back home and discussing with their wives about where uh, they should be constructing a house, for example. And the wives would be surprised that you've never had this kind of discussion with me. So she always felt very good that my husband is now including me in the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. So this is something which we have seen across the spectrum. then we found husbands uh, giving uh, g making the wife more mm. mobile buying a, a two wheeler for her maybe so that she can go out and take care of things to go shopping take care of the kids and the admissions etc etc and we also uh, found uh, husbands um, including their wife in the household financial management which so far had not been the case so yeah. these are subtle changes but we found that changes in the uh, personal relationship dynamics affect the way a man behaves at the workplace yeah. the bottom line over here is that there are fratricides and there are suicides in our armed forces uh, how much of a concern is this for you as as a leader in your force uh, dealing with you know something tragic and it does happen so the life of each man matters and if he is disturbed and he is driven to the point where he is contemplating suicide then for us that as leaders that's a matter of great concern and we need to be able to take care of it yeah and uh, one final question um, as a woman officer yourself dealing in the working in this exceptionally macho surrounding um, and talking about gender and talking about communication uh, i mean how do people react how do the men react to this do they see it as oh it's an order and i have to follow the order which of course is the basis upon which you work or is there a genuine um, increasing belief that you know what you're saying makes a lot of sense so i would say that the first session there is a lot of apprehension usually they don't know what they are getting into they don't know where it's leading but by the time they go through 3 4 sessions and certain exercises during these conversations the clarity it brings to them their the understanding and awareness that it brings to them as to how gender has impacted their lives and how they just need to change it by taking certain decisions is beautiful and you will see that on the ground yourself all right charu thank you so much for thank speaking you. to us